Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of APA and chair of the New Urbanism Division, and I'm your webcast moderator. Today, August 26th, we will hear the presentation, Raising the Bar, Tracing the Evolution of LGBTQ Enclaves in San Francisco. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the webcast toolbar, or you can call the 1-800 number that's shown on your screen in bold. For those content questions that you have related to the presentation, you can type those in the questions box, which is also located in your webinar toolbar. Uh, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Uh, coming up on your screen is a list of our sponsoring chapters and divisions for 2016. Thanks to all the participating sponsors for making these webcasts possible and free to their members. Today's webcast is sponsored uh, by the Gallup Division, Gays and Lesbians and Planning Division. To learn more about Gallup, you can visit planning.org slash divisions slash Gallup. And to learn about uh, all of our divisions, just visit planning.org slash divisions. On your screen is a list of our upcoming webcasts. You can register for these by visiting our webcast webpage at ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Um, a lot of folks have been asking when the next upcoming sessions are. Um, and you can see that I, I started a list of just our reserved sessions and who's sponsoring them and what the dates are, uh, just so that you know that we do, in fact, have sessions planned, um, but that they're just still being finalized and submitted for CM credit. But we do really have a full lineup through the end of the year, I promise. To log your CM credits for attending today's webcast, just head over to planning.org and log into your MyAPA account. And then uh, you can search activities by provider, um, or you can, which is the Gallup division, or you can just search today's uh, title, or you can search by, by the event number, all of which you can find on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcasts. And this webcast has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing only. We do have some recorded webcasts that are available for distance education. We have an ethics and a law. And you can check those out, get more information at our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. And like us on Facebook, Planning Webcast Series, you'll receive up-to-date information on our upcoming sessions uh, and any news about current sessions that are going on. And we are recording today's webcast. It will be available on our YouTube channel. You can just search Planning Webcast on YouTube. And a PDF of the PowerPoint will also be available at the end of the session. Again, webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. With that, uh, I am going to now turn it over to Cade Havick, who will get us started. All right. Thank you, Christine. Uh, my name is Cade Hobbick, and I'm a past chair of the Gays, Lesbians, and Planning Division of APA. And my role today is a simple one. I'm just providing an introduction to the session that our division is hosting. And I want to thank, first of all, Ben Frost and Christine Darcy Davis of the Ohio chapter for taking care of all the log logistics. Um, they make it really very, very easy. So thank you guys so much. I also want to give a special thanks to Shane Watson, who will be presenting today. While I'm a planner here in New York, Shane is an architectural historian in San Francisco. She's one of those knowledge specialists that we planners turn to or should be turning to throughout our work. And that's sort of the first part of our overall message, is that planners should be using every excuse and every opportunity to be reaching outside our, our our offices and our own practices to interact with the people who study other people and, and culture and, and places. And I think we tend to think about reaching out to biology specialists or uh, hazardous materials specialists or 
or other types of planners, but sometimes we neglect to reach out to the social scientists, and they really have a lot of great value that they can bring to our work. The second part of our message is, is related to that, and it's, um, it's the importance of considering both cultural identity and place together when we're thinking about neighborhoods and planning for them. So while this presentation may at first seem somewhat narrow and, and specialized in focus, Shane will be taking us on a tour of, of cultural history through the eyes of an architectural historian to demonstrate how community and place are related in profound and interesting and even quirky ways. Uh, so Shane's presentation focuses on a series of, of neighborhoods that are characterized by populations that are, by definition, outsider populations, so different types of LGBTQ communities and, and populations. Um, the LGBTQ community, in all its variations throughout history and different geographies, is one that sort of finds itself. One can say that we as a community move around in search of one another. And an old and not entirely untrue example of this is the young gay guy who moves from Kansas to New York City, um, or the young lesbian woman who moves from Texas to San Francisco. We all have other reasons for moving, of course, careers being one reason. But a sense of belonging, uh, historically, has, has been something that helps us form community and find ourselves in neighborhoods that we call ours. And despite many first impressions, maybe, maybe these are the first impressions, our community is anything but constant or homogenous. LGBTQ as an initialism only begins symbolically to hint at the extraordinary diverse interest of, of people who together self-identify as a community. And this is true for any community. Think about your own community. There are all kinds of people with all sorts of interests. And likewise, our neighborhoods are anything but constant, and they're not homogenous. And I point this out for two reasons. Something we want the audience to focus on throughout the course of this presentation are, are two concepts, diversity and change. Specifically how diversity and change are reflected in community and place. And this means paying very close attention to how quote unquote diverse communities are defined and what makes them diverse and how they change over time and how all these changes play out geographically so that we have this, as a result, a, a change in context as well. And that leads me to the final point, the timeliness of this subject matter. Some of you may know that the Stonewall Inn here in New York City was recently designated a national landmark. Um, it's kind of a big deal. Um, Stonewall is a place that is identified as a very strong and maybe the most visible beginning of the gay pride movement. Obviously, there's more to the story of the beginning and the story is ongoing, but Stonewall Inn serves as a landmark, and that's something relevant to neighborhoods and, and to cultural history, too, uh, particularly in light of these changes. How does a community keep track of its shared history and story and identity and sense mm -hmm. of place, especially when everything seems changing? So in a few seconds, Shane will be discussing the idea of landmarks and historic preservation specifically. And I know it sounds like I've just been preaching to the choir today, but I, I want everyone to enter into the presentation by, by this brilliant non-planner uh, as being something relevant to all planning interests and, and efforts. And I think it helps that this is a, a great presentation by a very, very knowledgeable historian who always finds really great visuals and manages to keep people amused. So with that, I turn it over to Shane. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Thanks to Christine and Cade, and especially to the Gays and Lesbians and Others in Planning Division for sponsoring this. Um, I'm an architectural historian and preservation planner based in the Bay Area. In addition to my traditional historic preservation work, I specialize in LGBTQ heritage preservation. Um, and I'll say right up front that um, I do prefer having the Q at the end of the acronym, but it's easier for me to say LGBT, so I'll probably just say that throughout the presentation. Um, 
I became interested in this work beginning in 2009 when I wrote my master's thesis on San Francisco's historic lesbian district in North Beach. As part of my thesis, I sought to understand what other cities across the country were doing to preserve their LGBT heritage. And the short answer to that question is that almost nothing was being done. There was only one site, one LGBT site listed in the National Register at the time, and maybe two or three local landmarks across the country. <laughs> Fast forward today to today, and it seems like everyone is talking about LGBT history. Um, I'll tell you about a few of the projects that are happening right now. In June 2014, the National Park Service kicked off an LGBTQ heritage initiative. This is a nationwide project that has resulted in a 1,200-page theme study with over 30 chapters written by uh, historians and preservationists across the country. The goal of this report is to develop historic context to which we can tie physical place that tell the story of this history in the United States. It will also help streamline the National Register and National Historic Landmark nomination processes. And the report should be released to the public in PDF format online this fall. At the statewide level, Kentucky and Virginia are working on LGBT context studies. And at the local level, New York, Washington, DC, Minneapolis, San Diego, have all embarked on similar projects. Los Angeles just completed their own LGBT context statement as part of a citywide survey. And the Los Angeles Conservancy, the uh, local preservation nonprofit, began working on an LGBT program that will result in a national register multiple property submission. Um, I'd like to point out, too, that out of the more than 90,000 properties listed in the national register, Fewer than 10 were listed for significance related to LGBT history. There are only two National Historic Landmarks, the Stonewall Inn and the Henry Gerber Home in Chicago. And as Cade mentioned, we now have our first LGBT, LGBT National Park, the Stonewall National Monument. So this is a really extraordinary time in historic preservation because all of these efforts really represent a movement that would have been unthinkable even a decade ago. Um, before I jump into the history portion of this presentation, I'll tell you a little bit about the project uh, from which this history comes. It's a report that I prepared with a colleague, a public historian named Donna Graves, for the San Francisco Planning Department. It's called the Citywide Historic Context Statement for LGBTQ History in San Francisco. It's a very technical title, but it's chock full of uh, what I think is very fascinating history that spans from the Native American period through the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. Um, so how and why did this report come about? Donna and I applied for and were awarded a $76,000 grant from the city's Historic Preservation Fund to write the report. We started work on the project in the fall of 2013, and it was adopted by the San Francisco Historic Preservation Commission last November. The goal of the report is to provide historic context about LGBT history in the city with a particular emphasis on the physical spaces and places that are related to this history. Historic context studies are used by city planners for guidance on how to make decisions about historic properties associated with a particular theme. The city of San Francisco has already used this report to make decisions about LGBT associated properties that have been proposed for demolition. Context statements also make it easier to landmark properties associated with these themes because the historic context has already been developed. So not a lot of hist additional history has to be written. Um, this slide is something that I think will be of interest to the planners on the call, um, which maybe all of you. <laughs> it's a screenshot of the planning department's property information map. Donna and I documented over 300 LGBT associated properties in this report and uh, data related to all of those properties was uploaded into the planning department's GIS map, which you can see here. So any property with an LGBT association is shaded in rainbow. Um, so with this data and this map, this is really the most important piece of our project in terms of historic preservation and actually trying to save historic buildings. Anytime a new development project is proposed at these sites, a little red flag goes up in the planning department that forces a certain level of due diligence in terms of cultural resources. 
Okay, uh, for the fun part of this talk now, um, or at least fun for me, the history. And as we all know, all LGBTQ history everywhere in the world began in the Castro. Um, right? <laughs> no, that's not right. Um, San Francisco is known throughout the world as headquarters for LGBT history, culture, and politics. And the Castro District is often honored with the designation of being San Francisco's first, quote, gay neighborhood. Um, the National Park Service, on its official website for LGBT history, even refers to the Castro as the, quote, oldest LGBT enclave in the country, end quote. This isn't true, of course. Um, it's far from it. Furthermore, all of San Francisco's three designated local landmarks are in the Castro. Um, I should point out that there are no LGBT sites listed in the National Register west of the Mississippi, so California doesn't have any LGBT National Register sites. So we have three local landmarks, and they're all in the Castro, um, and it's the Harvey Milk Residence and Camera Store where Harvey lived. It's a former theater where the AIDS Quilt Project was founded, and our most recent landmarks, a bar called the Twin Peaks Tavern that opened late 1960s. It was the first bar in the city to have open plate glass windows where everyone can see in and everyone can see out. So if we view San Francisco's LGBT history through the lens of historic preservation, the Castro seems to be all important. Uh, but what does this mean and what's missing? And that's what I'll talk about today. Essentially, what's missing is a very important and diverse history that unfolded long before the Castro became gay in the late 1960s. The chapter history, um, the Castro chapter in this history is relatively late. So I'll spend the next part of this talk walking us through the many decades of LGBT history that unfolded pre-Castro. This history really actually dates back to the Native American period, but I won't get into that, I won't go that far. Um, but it dates, also dates to the city's founding in the mid-1800s, and it in, unfolded in every neighbor, nearly every neighborhood across San Francisco. I don't have time to go into detail on all of the neighborhoods, so I'll focus on two, North Beach and Polk Street, and I'll provide short overviews for the others. North Beach became an LGBT neighborhood after the repeal of Prohibition in 1933. Um, but in order for us to get to that point, I'd like us to, I'd like to talk about why that happened. Um, originally called the Latin Quarter, North Beach has always been a mixing pot of cultures. It bumps up right against Chinatown at the southwest and the San Francisco Bay at the east. North Beach was first settled by French, Italian, South American, Spanish, and Portuguese immigrants. The neighborhood became known as Little Italy by the turn of the 20th century because two-thirds of the population was Italian, mostly men, mostly working class. Beginning in the mid-1800s, North Beach's southern boundary uh, was an area known as the Barbary Coast. The Barbary Coast was San Francisco's red light district from the gold rush through the 1910s. The streets were lined with saloons, concert and dance halls, gaming houses, and lots of brothels. It was home to a mix of races with American, Irish, German, and African-American business owners and patrons of many nationalities. Um, when a streetcar system was developed in the city in the last quarter of the century, this area was left off of the major lines, which added to the area's isolation and reputation as kind of a, a desolate wasteland. Um, in spite of, or perhaps because of this reputation, the Barbary Coast was the city's primary entertainment district for many decades. It was really like the Wild West, as you can see in this image. Um, and men, uh, I should also mention that early in the city's history, men outnumbered women almost 12 to 1 at certain points. Um, for a large, uh, this disparity was there for a large part of the city's early history. So this is also where we start to see documentation of homosocial and homosexual interactions. One of the most documented examples of this is female and male impersonating performances in the saloons and dance halls, especially in the Barbary Coast, as well as evidence of homosexual, uh, homosexual activity between female impersonating waitresses who worked at these saloons who were hooking up with male patrons. 
Um, while not exactly always homosexual in nature, these performers and their boundary, boundary blurring performances um, are generally understood to be at the roots of the city's current LGBT communities. These cross-gender performances are a thread that runs through most of this history, as you'll see in a little bit. So as time wore on and the Barbary Coast was cleaned up and sanitized for various reasons, this area of the city became home to a large population of artists, writers, and intellectuals, also known as the Bohemians. The Bohemians were located in a very cohesive district along the street. You see here Montgomery Street, which connects and crosses through North Beach. Um, up through the 1930s to 50s, many, many of the city's writers and artists had offices in the buildings here, including some of the city is, city's earliest known LGBT uh, poets and writers. So circling back to the repeal of prohibition, what I hope you're starting to see here is that North Beach had become quite a unique conglomeration of people and activity. After the repeal of prohibition, the neighborhood continued to grow as an international and bohemian residential enclave but it also regained its reputation as an entertainment district, especially for and because of the growing tourism industry. This is one of the most important points I want to hit home about these early LGBT neighborhoods that really appeared in a lot of major cities throughout the country after Prohibition. They probably couldn't have developed without the tourism industry. In the 1930s and 40s, restaurants and nightclubs that featured exoticized spaces and performers became super popular. These performers were often highly sexualized and racialized, as you can see here in the dancer on the left. The other important point I want to make here is that the nightclub, as an entertainment venue, really didn't exist until after Prohibition. It grew out of a post-Prohibition uh, complex post-prohibition liquor laws that would only allow hard alcohol to be served at hotels, restaurants, and clubs, not bars. So by introducing entertainment, even just a piano, a bar could serve hard liquor. The other thing about nightclubs in San Francisco is that really anyone could open one, which meant that the owner had total control over all aspects of their venue, unlike those in cities such as New York where gay and lesbian bars were controlled by organized crime. So nightclubs really helped spur the growth of LGBT communities in San Francisco because with very little oversight, owners were able to create discrete spaces where LGBT people felt safe to congregate in public. And that's a big deal, uh, I want to point out, because any display or form of non-heteronormative sexuality was criminal. And most people viewed LGBT men and women as pathological really all the way up until the 1970s, and still today in many parts of the world. So anyone arrested for a sex crime faced having their name, occupation, and home address printed in the newspaper, which frequently led to disastrous consequences such as lost jobs, financial in instability, and ostracism by family and friends. So right after, uh, right after the repeal of prohibition, three very important LGBT spaces appeared, all in North Beach, and all public spaces that provided alcohol and entertainment. All three of these spaces featured uh, highly sexualized cross-dressing performers, and all of them drew huge heterosexual crowds, both tourists and locals alike. But they also drew LGBT people who saw themselves in the performers and felt comfortable in these spaces where societal and gender norms were being blurred. A historian who writes so much about this early history, Nan Elamia Boyd, sums this point up well when she writes that sexualized and racialized tourism was a primary factor in the emergence of San Francisco's publicly visible queer communities. It showcased difference and in doing so generated a permissive quality of same-sex and cross-race sexual display. As sexualized entertainments became part of San Francisco's allure, Tourist industry dollars cast a thin veneer of protection around the city's queer entertainments. So really everything just fell into place after Prohibition. It was a kind of a perfect storm. Literally uh, dozens of LGBT bars opened and closed in North Beach from the 1930s to the 1960s. The neighborhood is also notable as San Francisco's first lesbian residential district, 
because of the number of women who lived and socialized there. I'm going to quickly tell you a little bit about these three places that I just mentioned. They are uh, places called Finocchio's, the Black Cat Cafe, and Mona's 440 Club. Finocchio's first opened as a restaurant and speakeasy during Prohibition. It was owned by uh, the husband and wife, Joe and Marjorie Finocchio, Italian immigrants. Um, actually, Joe was just an, an Italian immigrant. Marjorie was born here, I believe. They were a heterosexual couple. Um, Pinocchio's is one of the first places in San Francisco known to feature female impersonating performers, and it is one of the earliest places documented to be popular with LGBT communities. Um, touching on what I mentioned earlier, Pinocchio's performers always, or the performances always featured very exotic looking men dressed as women. They were advertised as hula dancers and quote, oriental dancers. Beginning in the late 1930s, Finocchio has moved to the street you see here, Broadway, in the building on the corner at the right of this photo. Broadway was the main entertainment drag in North Beach and eventually became home to some of San Francisco's most famous early LGBT hotspots. Um, the Finocchio space on Broadway has been described as very swank and lavish, and it became a San Francisco institution. Performances featured some of the country's most famous female impersonators, and the nightly shows at Pinocchio's became models for nightclubs throughout the country. Historians have said that female impersonators at nightclubs like Pinocchio's served as heroes to the pre-Stonewall gay community because of their overt queerness. Pinocchio's on Broadway was wildly popular with tourists, as you can see in the group <laughs> at the right. Um, largely because it was one of the primary stops on the Gray Line nightclub bus tour for over 50 years. Um, many of Finocchio's performers were gay, so it was also popular with LGBT communities. Um, Finocchio's was actually open until 1999. It was not very gay in 1999. Uh, the, now we're back on Montgomery Street, the Bohemian Artery that I mentioned earlier. This is just around the corner from Finocchio's. The Black Cat Cafe opened on Montgomery Street in 1933. Um, the Black Cat is similar to Finocchio's in that it became popular with LGBT communities because of the famous drag operas by um, Jose Saria, who later became a really a truly uh, gay rights pioneer. It was also popular with tourists. Um, it wasn't a flashy nightclub. It was more of a bohemian cafe. All of the documentation about this place describes it as a mixing pot of sexualities, races, cultures. Allen Ginsberg, the um, beat poet, called it uh, the best gay bar in America. He said it was totally open, bohemian, San Francisco. Everybody went there, heterosexual and homosexual. All the gay screaming queens would come, the heterosexual gray flannel suit types, longshoremen, all the poets went there. <clears throat> Excuse me. What makes the Black Cat one of the most significant LGBT sites in California is its association with one of the most significant legal cases in LGBT history. After years of harassment by the local police, the Black Cat's liquor license was pulled for the second time in 1949. The heterosexual owner of the Black Cat, Saul Stuman, fought the charges and appealed his case to the California Supreme Court and ultimately won in 1951. That case essentially legalized homosexuality in Cal homosexual assembly in California, which prior to the ruling was a punishable offense. Um, this was a temporary win, of course, because policing agencies found loopholes and really continued cracking down on these spaces for the next uh, two decades. The Black Cat Cafe is equally important because it served as the political headquarters for Jose Saria's 1961 campaign for the San Francisco Board of Supervisors. This campaign was the first time in history, anywhere in the world, I think, that an openly gay candidate ran for elective, elective office. He didn't win, but this candidacy sparked the beginning of LGBT political movements. Um, in 1963, after a nearly 15-year battle, the Black Cat's final appeal to the California Supreme Court was denied and the bar was forced to close. 
this is a very complicated history that I'm sort of glossing over. The legal history about this site is fascinating. Um, if you want to look into it. Um, and now we're back to Broadway, uh, just up the street from Finocchio's, just east of Finocchio's. We're at Mona's 440 Club, which you can see lower right, the little uh, neon sign poking out. Um, Mona's 440 Club was one of the earliest and most famous lesbian nightclubs in California. Um, Mona Sargent, the owner, was a heterosexual woman who joined San Francisco's Bohemian crowd in 1928 when she moved to a very, very famous Bohemian building on Montgomery Street. Um, the 440 Club was her third venue. She opened her first bar up the hill, also in North Beach, and a second bar um, on Columbus, I believe, and then this bar finally in uh, 1939. Um, Mona started gaining a large, very large lesbian following early on, and the reason for this, of course, was that Mona's featured um, male impersonating waitresses and performers. It, Mona's quickly became an institution for lesbians and tourists in San Francisco. Um, it remained the only lesbian-oriented club in the city until after World, World War II. At some point in the bar's history, there was a marquee out front that advertised Mona's as the place where, quote, girls will be boys. We've heard that the walls were decorated with murals of naked women. So it was one of these very exoticized, sexualized spaces I mentioned earlier. Um, it was especially popular with military personnel during World War II, which is another theme that we see throughout this early history. Um, Mona sold her share of the 440 Club in the mid-1940s, but the club continued to operate as a lesbian space um, well into the 1950s and I believe the 1960s. So with this next slide, I'd like to circle back to a thread I mentioned when I was talking about the Barbary Coast. The male impersonating performers you see here at Mona's 440 Club probably seemed really exotic and new in the 1940s, but with this comparison, you can see um, that this type of entertainment predated Mona's by decades. The two performers on the right were advertised in San Francisco new newspapers in the 1910s. So I'll end here with North Beach. Um, the story of why North Beach didn't last as an LGBT enclave is uh, quite long and complex, but it boils down to police crackdowns and McCarthy-era politics in the 1950s and changing neighborhood dynamics from the 1950s to the 1960s. I believe the last LGBT-centric space closed in the mid or late 1960s in North Beach. Um, another LGBT enclave in San Francisco that developed concurrently with North Beach is the Tenderloin, which I'll discuss very briefly, even though it deserves so much more time. The Tenderloin has one of San Francisco's most important LGBT histories. In my conversation about the Barbary Coast, um, I mentioned that the neighborhood was cleaned up and sanitized in the early, tw early 20th century. What I didn't mention is this. Um, in 1914, there was a progressive era law called the Red Light Abatement Act that closed brothels throughout California. Um, brothels were relatively well regulated up to that point. So after the law passed, prostitution was forced to move to the streets. The Tenderloin became a headquarters for San Francisco's sex trade, which included straight, gay, and transgender prostitutes. The Tenderloin is a really unique um, is really unique as the densest residential neighborhood in the city. It has a huge collection of single occupancy residential hotels that still exist today. <clears throat> These hotels provided low-income housing to working class and often single men and women. The neighborhood was also chock full of regular hotels, <clears throat> excuse me, restaurants, bars, nightclubs, bathhouses, theaters. And as we learned in the section on North Beach, this type of neighborhood proved to be fertile ground for budding LGBT communities. And the Tenderloin developed into an early LGBT enclave. Two of the city's first LGBT bars, the Old Crow and the Silver Rail, 
opened in the Tenderloin in the 1930s and 40s. You can see the silver rail in this photograph on the right. Uh, at the end of this block was an intersection at uh, Turk, Mason, and Market Streets, and this corner became so popular for gay hustling that it was nicknamed the Meat Market. The Tenderloin was also very popular with gay servicemen during World War II. Gay bars were officially off limits to military personnel, but gay men got around this by trading their uniforms for civilian clothes at designated locker spots throughout the neighborhood. The Tenderloin also became a residential and social enclave for the city's transgender community, many of whom were relying on sex for income. The neighborhood is highly significant as a place where transgender men and women were able to live, work, and receive social and medical services. This uh, the history, LGBT history continues today because two of the city's longest running gay and transgender bars remain in the Tenderloin. So now we're going to pop over to Polk Street, the city's first LGBT uh, commercial district. And I'll go into more detail on Polk Street because uh, I think it's an interesting contrast to North Beach and the Tenderloin. Unlike those neighborhoods, which were largely entertainment districts, Polk Street was home to San Francisco's first gay commercial businesses beginning in the 1960s. I'm going to start early in the neighborhood's history to show you a little bit about how Polk Street developed. San Francisco is a peninsula with the San Francisco Ocean on the west, or um, the Pacific Ocean on the west, and the San Francisco Bay on the north and the east. The city was first developed on the shore of the bay at the northeast. Everything to the west was essentially sandbanks. When the area of the original city was first platted, when the area west of the original city was first platted, it was called the Western Edition, which you can see on this map here. Polk Street was one of the first major north-south commercial thoroughfares in the Western Edition. In the late 19th century, the Western Edition was largely residential and predominantly upper middle class. Residents were mostly business owners and other professionals. This area was not only home to the city's largest population of women, the largest concentration of Germans. There was a big Jewish, Jewish population, and later on the Western Edition became home to Japantown and a large African-American community. The map you see here shows Polk Street at the bottom in 1899, and right above Polk is Van Ness Avenue. Um, as you can see, up here, Van Ness Avenue is lined with these enormous mansions that just continued all the way down. Um, whereas Polk Street was Van Ness's commercial corridor. Totally different composition, much denser with these narrow commercial storefronts. There's a large dance hall here. This area was also home to the Lurleen Saltwater Baths, which was a huge indoor swimming pool. There was a beer company called the Chicago Brewery, and there was a gigantic indoor shopping market called the Grand Western Market. Um, after the 1906 earthquake, all of Polk Street was destroyed, and everything around it was destroyed. The mansions on Van Ness Avenue and everything along Van Ness were dynamited to create a fire break that ultimately saved the western half of the city. Polk Street was rebuilt almost right away and looked very similar to how it did pre-quake, with storefronts at the ground level and small residential units above. Van, o Van Ness also became a major commercial artery. So Polk Street has a really funny, quirky history. It has always been kind of a party street. Even before 1906, it was full of saloons, so many saloons. Um, but the party really took off in the late 1930s, as you can see here, when San Francisco was celebrating the opening of the Golden Gate Bridge and the Bay Bridge. The whole city went a little nuts during this period. Um, men dressed up as cowboys, women dressed up as Spanish, Spanish senoritas. Um, on Polk Street, entire storefronts, like you see here, were redecorated to make the whole scene look like the Wild West. 
Th uh, there are newspapers that are very funny that talk about thousands of people partying on what they nicknamed, the street they nicknamed was, uh, was Polk Gulch, and that nickname kind of lasted for a long time. So this was repeated again. The party was repeated again in 1939 for the Golden Gate International, International Exposition. <clears throat> Excuse me. And again in the 1940s as part of a series of events known as the Portola Festivals. There is one building on Polk Street today that retains a Wild West facade. Um, and I'll show it to you later. It's rumored that it dates to this period, but I'm really not sure about that. Sorry, some of these slides are fuzzy. So when people weren't partying on Polk Street, um, it continued to serve as a traditional and very heterosexual commercial corridor, corridor. Here's an image from 1941 showing the opening celebration for Weinstein's department store on Polk. This was about 20 years before the neighborhood started to become gay. And it, as you can see, it's a pretty vanilla crowd. The building here <laughs> uh, now houses a sex toy store called Good Vibrations. So how did Polk Street go gay? Um, again, this is a complex story with various threads. As I mentioned earlier, LGBT spaces in North Beach as well as the Tenderloin were under constant surveillance and harassment by policing agencies in the 1940s and 50s. And when those places closed, other places popped up outside of the neighborhoods, including Polk Street. Another major influence was the changing face of the city after World War II. The city was slowly deindustrialized as heavy industry moved across the bay to East Bay, Oakland, Richmond areas like that. And San Francisco's econ economy became focused on service-based industries like finance and tourism, which left a large blue-collar working force with very few jobs. Massive infrastructure projects like new freeway systems made commuting into the city easier, which in part led to large populations fleeing the city into the suburbs. Um, also, massive redevelopment projects started destroying huge swaths of San Francisco's neighborhoods, which contributed to the flight from the city. So by the 1950s and 60s, there were many vacancies across San Francisco and rents were really low which allowed new communities to form. Lesbians ended up going to the Haight-Ashbury and Mission Valencia districts. Gay Leathermen formed a sex-based community in the South of Market area. The Tenderloin became home, as I mentioned, to the growing transgender community. And Polk Street became the city's first commercial district as gay men started opening businesses in the neighborhood. Redevelopment really hit home in the LGBT community. The image you see here is one of the city's most popular gay leather bars in the 1960s. It was called the Detour at 888 McAllister Street. <clears throat> and here's that same block um, being demolished in 1971. And this is an image of the toolbox at 4th and Harrison Street in the South of Market area, one of the city's first leather bars. This image is from a highly influential Life magazine article from 1964 that called San Francisco the gay capital of America. And here's the toolbox in 1971. So jumping back to Polk Street, that same 1964 Life magazine article that featured the toolbox also featured an image of the Jump and Frog bar on Polk Street. It was a typical storefront bar that was transformed into a theater every night to show movies, which you can see here. The fact that Life magazine article featured an image of Polk Street of a Polk Street gay bar is really important. Historians now look at this 1964 article as contributing to the massive flood of LGBT people into the city in the 1960s and 70s, um, and the establishment of the city's reputation as a gay mecca. You can imagine gay people in the middle of nowhere, LGBT people I should say, in the middle of nowhere in America reading this article and suddenly hitching a ride to San Francisco to visit these places, the toolbox, the jumping frog. So how did Polk Street become gay enough in 1964 to be featured in Life magazine? 
Um, I'll mention a few reasons. After the police crackdown on the bars in the 1950s and the loss of important gay spaces through redevelopment, gay men specifically were undoubted, undoubtedly looking to establish a permanent home somewhere in the city. Uh, like the rest of the city, residents in the post district, um, heterosexual residents in the post district were fleeing the city, leaving many vacancies and cheap rents. Many of the storefronts on Polk Street, I did some city directory, directory research, um, and it showed that many of the storefronts on Polk that would eventually house gay businesses in the 1960s were really vacant through the 1950s. Additionally, Polk Street in the 1950s had a proliferation of shops that would have attracted or been operated, operated by gay men. This is also came out of city directory research. There were a lot of florists, um, barber and beauty shops, art galleries, antique stores, and clothing stores. Um, and as you can see in this map, <laughs> Polk Street was also ideal because of its proximity to cruising areas. Um, a very popular one at Aquatic Park and, of course, um, the Tenderloin, which isn't really hi highlighted here, but um, it's Turk Street down there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, there were a few early gay businesses surrounding Polk Street that marked the neighborhood as a gay destination. One of these was Jack's Turkish Baths at... Um, uh, sorry, on at 1143 Post at Polk Street. Um, Jack's, it was a gay bathhouse. It opened in 1941. Jack's clientele was predominantly gay men, um, especially during World War II. Very popular. We think Jack was gay. Um, and it was one of the longest running and most popular gay bathhouses in San Francisco. One block north of Jack's Baths was the 1228 Club at 1228 Sutter. This club was featured in a gay guidebook in 1954. So as early as, as the 1940s and 50s, gay men were venturing north of the Tenderloin and into Lower Polk. Now I'm going to present a handful of sites on Polk Street that played really crucial roles in the development of the neighborhood as a gay enclave. In 1962, an organization called the Tavern Guild was formed by a group of gay bar owners who were just fed up and uh, sick and tired of being harassed and shut down by police. The Guild's first president was the bartender at the Suzy Q, which went into this space on the left at 1741 Polk Street in 1961. The Tavern Guild was the first gay business organization in the country. It was organized as a direct response to the bar raids of the 1950s. Almost every gay bar in the city paid membership dues, which allowed the Tavern Guild to maintain a budget for lawyers and bail when guild members were arrested or the bars were under attack. They also had an extensive telephone network that they used to alert bar owners when police were conducting raids across the city. The Tavern Guild became one of the strongest LGBT political organizations in San Francisco. Many of the guild's earliest meetings were held here at the Suzy Q. This is pretty important because the Tavern Guild really helped reverse the tide of police harassment in the city and the organization wasn't afraid to set up shop on Polk Street, so that says something about Polk in the early 1960s. This slide shows the building that housed Gramophone Records at 1538 Polk Street. Gramophone was opened in 1962 by a gay couple named Randall Wallace and Dean Stemapatopoulos. <laughs> um, they already owned a record store, the couple already owned a record store in the Marina District, just north of the Polk, and they were becoming well known in the music retail industry in San Francisco. Gramophone is really significant as one of the first gay-owned businesses on Polk Street. It later became the headquarters for the disco scene and featured these very popular in-store signings by artists like Bill Bette Midler and uh, the Manhattan Transfer. <laughs> Another gay-owned business that opened in 1962 was the Town Squire at 1310 Polk, um, 1318. It was owned by a gay couple, again, named uh, 
again, another gay couple, Sal Torito and Terry Popek. Even the 1950s, Polk Street was lined with new and used clothing shops. But there was a boom in the early 1960s, and most of the stores started catering to gay men. <clears throat> I found a uh, very funny KTVU news report from 1968 that describes Polk Street as the headquarters for far out clothing. Um, the reporter goes into the town squire and another gay clothing store called The Casual Man. And here, uh, here are a few screenshots from the video. At the end of the video, the newsman on the left rips off his fake mustache. <laughs> Um, so antique stores also started popping up on Polk Street in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And I'm stereotyping a little bit to think these places were owned by gay men. Um, but there was one that popped up in 1959 that I would uh, bet a million dollars was owned by a gay man. It was called the um, Den of Antiquity at 1713 Polk Street. So now for more serious history. 1965 was a very um, big year in LGBT history in San Francisco. And the California Hall, which you can see here at uh, 625 Polk Street, played a major role. In 1964, an organization called Council on Religion and the Homosexual was formed. It was, the, um, it was a collaboration between Glide Memorial Methodist Church and leaders of the city's earliest gay rights groups. This was the first time in the country that religious leaders and members of the LGBT community joined together to fight homophobia. Um, on January 1st, 1965, the group held its first fundraising event at California Hall. They expected to run into trouble with the police, so they acquired the necessary permits and followed all of the rules, but this police still showed up in force and caused um, and harassed uh, patrons as they tried to enter the event. An officer took photographs of the 500 or so people who showed up. Six people were arrested, including two attorneys. The following morning, the ministers who helped organize the event held a press conference expressing outrage at the police harassment. The ACLU got involved. It was the first time the ACLU took a gay rights case. All charges were eventually dropped, but this incident has um, gone down in history as highly significant, and it's been called San Francisco Stonewall because it marked a turning point in the city's gay rights movements. Um, California Hall continued to serve as a community center for the LGBT community long after this, I should mention. The Daughters of Belitis, which is the nation's first lesbian rights organization, which was founded in San Francisco, held its first public event there in 1965. Um, and this image you see here shows a Tavern Guild Halloween party at California Hall in the 1970s. After the California Hall incident, gay rights in San Francisco made, a, made huge strides. Um, and after the Stonewall Inn riots in New York City in 1969, San Francisco has remembered that event by hosting the city's first gay pride march. It consisted of about 20 to 30 drag queens marching from Aquatic Park down Polk Street to City Hall. A few more gay pride parades were held on Polk Street until it was finally moved to where it still exists now on Market Street. Um, so just a quick brief overview of what was happening on Polk Street in the 1970s and 80s. Um, Polk Street became very openly gay in the 1970s. And one reason for this is that gay sex, homosexual sex, was finally decriminalized in 1975, which let people be a little bit more open about their sexuality. Um, and dozens, consequently dozens, of new businesses opened during the decade. The slide you see here shows a database of businesses catering to LGBT people on Polk Street between the 1960s and the 80s. Um, Red, the red is uh, the 1960s, green is 1970s, and orange is 1980s. In the 1970s, 
Polk Street also became very popular for gay cruising and sex. Um, all of the little alleys, streets that extend off of Polk became notorious for gay cruising at night. Um, businesses that supported gay cruising and sex also appeared, including lots of um, triple X bookstores and theaters. The scene really started to uh, die down in the 80s, um, not only because Castro was becoming the next best thing, but also because the AIDS epidemic resulted in the closure of many gay businesses and areas in San Francisco, especially, um, or specifically, gay bathhouses. And by the 18, or 1980s, Polk Street had become known for a pretty raunchy sex activity. One of the longest running gay businesses on Polk Street, and the only gay bar on Polk Street today, is the Sench that I mentioned earlier, the Sench that I mentioned earlier at 1723 Polk. This is the place that has a Wild West facade that I'm not sure dates back to the 1930s. Um, the Sench opened around 1979, which makes it one of the city's longest continuously operating gay bars. So that's the end of the Polk Street portion, and I just want to quickly mention another very cohesive LGBT enclave that um, developed kind of concurrently with the Polk Street area, and that's the South of Market district. Um, the South of Mar Market LGBT um, enclave was really focused on the leather community, which started developing in the 1950s. Um, the city's first leather bar opened in the 1950s, and um, South of Market's LGBT community grew to dozens of bars, bathhouses, and um, sex clubs, which were all concentrated in a very small area. Um, but again, because it was a sex-based community, the neighborhood was essentially shut down during the AIDS epidemic, though some of the city's longest-running um, LGBT bars are still there. And concurrently with Polk and South of Market, <laughs> the Mission Valencia district became home to a very vibrant and active lesbian feminist community all the way through the 1990s, actually. Um, there were bookstores, bars, cafes, and the city's one and only bathhouse for women, which was called Ocento. Um, the headquarters of the district was the women's building, and the women's building was largely organized by lesbians and still continues to serve women in the community today. The Mission Valencia is also important for its role in serving San Francisco's Latino LGBT communities. So, as you can see, there's a lot of history here, um, and I would bet that a majority of San Franciscans and anyone who visits the city don't really know much about this, um, which is why I want to talk about it today. So that concludes my presentation. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for Q&A. We do, actually, and we, okay. we do have some questions coming through. Uh, folks, again, if you have questions, just type them into the chat box um, in your webcast toolbar. Um, the first one, you just mentioned uh, Latino LGBT. There's a question that's coming through. Uh, do you have LGBT info for ethnic minorities? Can you talk a little bit more about ethnic minorities in the, the LGBT community in San Francisco? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very good point. As you can see, a lot of the early images are very white, and um, a lot of the history or a lot of the documentation Let's just take a step back. So what the, one of the biggest challenges that Donna and I confronted when we worked on the context statement for San Francisco is the overall lack of documentation related to this history period, but very, very minimal documentation of um, LGBT people of color and other under, very underrepresented groups such as 
transgender men and women, bisexual history. Um, so it's it, that's a challenging part of documenting this history. But um, we do go into as much detail as we can in the context statement about um, the significance of these underrepresented, underdocumented communities. Um, like I mentioned, the, Melissa, uh, the Mission Valencia district, which now has a very large Latino population, was very important for LGBT Latino um, people. There was a bar that just closed in the last couple years, Esta Noche. It was the um, last LGBT Latino bar in the city. Um, and then, of course, there's the really hard, um, difficult, and tragic history related to bars, specifically in the Castro, that were um, uh, I, I guess there's no other better way to say it than discriminated against LGBT people of color by forcing patrons to show multiple forms of identification to get into the bars, um, which ultimately prompted places to open that specifically catered to certain groups. There were bars that catered mostly to African-American men. There was a place on Polk Street that catered to um, LGBT Asians, Pacific Islanders. It was called uh, the In Touch. So yeah, the, it's such an important part of this history, and I'm sorry I didn't mention that <laughs> in the presentation. I glossed over so much. I really just wanted to focus on neighborhood development here. OK, uh, next question. Um, the asker says, trying to figure out how to find the rainbow parcels in the San Francisco property information map. Is that publicly available? Yeah, so what you have to do is um, you type in an address at the top. So I typed in 440 Broadway, which was known as 440 Club. And then you have to click on a, uh, there's a tab at the top called, I think it's Preservation. And then there are lots of different buttons that you can click on. And there's, I think there's a button called Context Statements. So if you click on that and you zoom out, um, it should show. You can zoom out and show this entire city, which just becomes one entire rainbow <laughs> because there are so many sites. But um, if you click on that, that would show all of the parcels. But it can be specific to a single address or, like I said, if you zoom out, you can show everywhere in the city with these associations. OK. Um, thank you. Next question. Lesbian history is often lost in the larger LGBT context, especially now when lesbian identity is out of vogue. Is there a concerted effort to uh, specifically document lesbian history? Yes. Um, so it was not hard, not very hard to find information for our study on lesbian history because um, the GLBT Historical Society, I should mention, was really a crucial partner in our work. And their archives are incredible in San Francisco. And there are so many hundreds of oral history interviews with people who are no longer with us, but they date back to the some of them people who were living in San Francisco in the 1930s. So um, there's lots of documentation on lesbian history, but as far as what we're doing now, um, the one thing that comes to mind, the one project that comes to mind is a project called um, the Lesbian or the Lexington uh, Archives Project, I believe it is. Um, San Francisco no longer has a lesbian bar, which is kind of incredible. It's incredible. Um, so our last lesbian bar closed a couple of years ago. It was called the Lexington, and it was in the Mission Valencia neighborhood that I talked about a little bit. And before it closed, everyone was very, very intentional about documenting the space as it was closing. It was kind of a long closure. And this group of women formed this organization 
called the Lexington Archives Project, I believe, to document LGBT, that specific space in the city, but also LGBT history. Um, nationwide, another one that comes to mind, there's a oral history project coming out of New Orleans that focuses on history of lesbian spaces. Um, but I think there's a lot going on. It's, it's, yeah. I mean, not a lot, I, but some great projects. Okay, thank you. Um, so the development of the LGBTQ community in San Francisco from the very beginning up until now, uh, how does that sort of parallel or not parallel other cities and their development of LGBTQ communities? I, I mean, the, the thing that makes, I think, the very similar from what I understand, like very similar themes and patterns, but the di major distinctions are, at least this early history that I talked about, kind of boil down to the difference in liquor laws. I mean, so much about San Francisco's, the way that the, these bars and nightclubs were are operated and shut down and policed and harassed um, had to do with these very complex post-prohibition liquor laws. Um, and I'm pretty sure, or from what I understand, cities like New York, their bars, I think the Stonewall Inn included, was were um, managed by organized crime, mafia. So the, San Francisco was able to kind of flourish because it wasn't restricted by that kind of oversight. But um, yeah, so many similar themes. So the city of Los Angeles worked on a similar study uh, to the one we did in San Francisco, and early themes of cross-gender entertainment and um, community development in bars and public spaces um, and development of homophile organizations in the 1950s that led to development of gay rights, gay pride, gay liberation. Um, they were all sort of happening at the same time. So lots of parallels, actually. Okay. Some differences. Oh, go ahead. I would just say lots of parallels, but, but also some differences. Sure. Um, so you've, you've talked a lot about um, um, bars and clubs and enter entertainment, things like that. Um, what, what about housing? Do a lot of these people live, uh, the LGBT community, um, do they kind of all live in these areas as well? Um, or are they, you know, is everyone sort of spread out everywhere? How, how does the housing situation work? So community, we have a section in the report called Community Development and Private Residences, which was so, also so crucial to this history because for so many of these people, they were afraid to gather in public because they, their lives could be destroyed. They could go to jail. They could be institutionalized. So, so much of the um, early community development happened at private parties. Of course, it's really hard to find documentation about private parties, but we have enough to kind of put some, uh, to uh, connect the dots. Um, but as far as actual residential enclaves, we know that North Beach and Telegraph Hill, which was in North Beach, was home to a lot of lesbians. Um, it became kind of known as a lesbian area in the 1950s, I think. Um, Mission Valencia, when the lesbians left North Beach, they ended up in M Mission Valencia, and they lived there. It was definitely a commercial and residential enclave. Polk Street was, um, I haven't done enough in-depth research on Polk Street to know if it was more than just a commercial district. But the Castro certainly became, um, I mean, one of the reasons Castro developed, I didn't get into that at all, is uh, similar to the Polk, a lot of the housing stock there was vacant because people were leaving the neighborhood. So gay men moved in and they fixed up these Victorians and it became a very um, gay residential enclave. Does that answer the question? Yes, absolutely, thank you. So we know, um, especially historically, 
<clears throat> that these that these enclaves, as they developed, um, were good economic engines, and um, that there were bars and people um, were spending their money there and entertainment, things like that. Um, so fast forward to today, in your opinion, why is it important to try to preserve these enclaves? Well, I'm not necessarily proposing to preserve these residential enclaves. I mean, I don't know how many people are aware of what's happening in San Francisco, but the entire fabric and character of San Francisco has changed dramatically in the last couple of years because of skyrocketing rents and, you know, because of the tech industry and other and uh, speculative development. Um, so the Castro is almost prohibitively expensive. Um, so many people have been forced out. Many people say that the Castro is not even very gay anymore, and that's really our last LGBT, like truly LGBT enclave. Um, so for me, the important part of this is really just getting these stories documented so that people like me can see our history reflected in, you know, not only this official documentation, but also individual landmarks. Um, so I guess I'm more interested in just seeing individual landmarks than entire neighborhoods. I just, I mean, I would love to preserve the Castro as a gay enclave, but it just feels impossible and not really fair, <laughs> if that makes sense. Absolutely. Um, next question, can you address the beginnings of the lesbian communities in San Francisco? Much of the early history described presents gay men and female impersonation. Yeah, um, that's a very good point. It's um, the actual history kind of gets lost in the focus. I was really hitting home the theme of cross-gender entertainment, I know. Um, but uh, so the, the story about Mona's 440 Club is really one of the most er, important early lesbian stories. Um, Mona, the story about kind of how the lesbian community formed in San Francisco kind of starts with Mona, um, the heterosexual bohemian I mentioned. She, in her second bar, uh, the, a young woman who'd just been kicked out of her family's house for being lesbian went to Mona crying and said, how can I get a, you know, can you help me? And Mona said, I can't really help you, but I can give you a job, and will you dress in a tuxedo? <laughs> and so um, that's kind of how the story of Mona started, and that's also kind of how the story of the lesbian community started. So lesbians were drawn to places like Mona's because Mona and people, these bar owners who were largely heterosexual, were really extraordinarily um, not exactly supportive but tolerant of these people in these communities. So Mona allowed lesbians to come to her bar. She allowed them to be together, um, hold hands underneath the table. They couldn't dance because it was illegal. Um, but we have so many oral history interviews that talk about lesbians and their experiences in, in Mona's and other places in North Beach. Um, but again, like I said earlier, so much of the documented history is focused on white gay men. So we do consider lesbian history kind of underrepresented, underdocumented, but we really tried in our report to do as much as we could. Okay, next question. Now that LGTBQ properties are identified and can be flagged in planning review, uh, what consideration is given in the planning process? Um, so I'll tell you about a recent example in San Francisco um, that, that came out of, uh, well, of properties getting flagged. So this very, very popular, beloved lesbian bar called Amelia's that um, opened in Mission Valencia in the late 1960s. Um, it's in a building that has been proposed for demolition. The owner um, wants to demolish the building and build condos so that he and his wife can retire there. 
And the consultant who wrote the evaluation report ended up concluding, or you know, it's the California Environmental Quality Act that forces these evaluations. So it was a CEQA study. The CEQA study concluded that Amelia, the Amelia's building is not a historic resource and therefore could be demolished. I think the consultant concluded that it was not an individual resource but does contribute to a potential lesbian historic district in Mission Valencia. Um, the city rejected that conclusion based on what we documented in the context statement and now the developer has been forced to um, kind of go back to the drawing board. In the last, there was a public meeting this Wednesday and I don't know what the result was, but from what I've heard it sounds like the owner is now rethinking the plans to demolish and is going to build his condo on top of the existing historic building. <laughs> and then there was another case study um, about the two buildings, two bars I mentioned in the Tenderloin that appeared in the 1930s and 40s, the Old Crow and the Silver Rail. Half of that block has been proposed for demolition and um, the city has approved the demolition because um, while they didn't agree, I actually appealed the project. <laughs> but ultimately, it went back to the city, and the city revised the report to make it a little bit more inclusive and correct. Um, but they have said the buildings are not individually significant. But what they did say is that, and therefore they could be demolished, but what they did say is that they contribute to a potential LGBTQ historic district in the Tenderloin. And so part of the study, um, which was another CEQA evaluation, the city had to do so much additional work, or did so much additional work, really wonderful work, to identify boundaries of this Tenderloin LGBTQ historic district um, and ultimately concluded that these bars contribute to that district, but um, demolition of those bars would not constitute a significant adverse effect because there are so many other places in the Tenderloin that contribute to the district, which is kind of an interesting conclusion. But yeah, so I think more than anything, this report is causing the planning department a lot of problems because there are so many sites that are associated with this history and so much development. So it's almost a continual stream of questions about, okay, we have another LGBT associated building, what do we do with this? It's been pro proposed for demolition, what do we do? But there is a lot of guidance in the back of our report that I hope is helping. You know, I'm going to interject just briefly here. As someone who does these environmental reviews like in California or anything NEPA or SECA or so forth, you know, very often the planner is doing these reviews. What is needed is this documentation, like the, the context statement and, and theme reports that Shane is talking about. So it's kind of the first step in my mind of even having some sort of documentation that planners can refer to and say, well, this is what we think would be the case. And then the decision makers, the city, as Shane mentioned, gets to decide. So it, it is quite big progress, I think. Um, great. Uh, it looks like we have one more question. Uh, it's interesting to note the similar transitions of the LGBTQ communities in San Francisco and Black Beach front communities as segregation has been reduced legally and socially. Can you comment on the impacts of this trend on the urban form? Uh, I, I didn't catch the second part of the question. I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? Um, can you comment on the uh, impacts of the LGBT communities um, on the urban form? Uh, I, I guess I didn't catch the first part of that question either. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, it says it's interesting to note uh, the, the similar transitions of the LGBTQ communities in San Francisco and Black Beach um, as segregation has been reduced and it's legal and social. 
uh, can you comment on the impacts of this trend on the urban form? I don't think I understand this question. I, okay. So I'm assuming it, the question is about North Beach, or is this about Black Beach? I'm sorry. It, it, no, yeah. it's OK. Oh, go ahead, Kate. Well, I was just thinking, you know, I, where, whatever part of the city we're talking about, what I really gathered from a lot of the presentation was that there wasn't so much change in form, per se, but change in, in patterns of settlement. And it was either because of documentation or, or otherwise, very much related to business patterns. So I think in, maybe in response to the question, is, is there a way, how, do we still see enclaves, or do we see dispersal, or, or what, what do we see now in San Francisco? Oh, I see. OK, I'm sorry. I understand the question now. Urban, so how, how does this uh, translate into the actual form, urban form? Um, but I think you're right, Cade, that really um, the form of these different neighborhoods, just as far as the building stock, I think if that's what is being asked here, um, it, it didn't change with the exception of these large areas of redevelopment, which uh, did force total relocation of communities. Um, and that was the case in the South of Market area. Uh, so, so many blocks of South of Market were redeveloped in the 1960s, demolished and rebuilt, um, which also, I think, contributed to the development of the South of Market, portions of the South of Market as like this really discrete leather sex-based community because it, um, that particular part of the neighborhood was this kind of light industrial area that was busy during the day, but it shut down at night. Um, so I don't know if that helps answer that question. I'm sorry, I didn't understand it at first. I think it's also, hint, the question might also be sort of hinting at this idea of, of gentrification. Um, they, I, I mean, you know, on the one hand, we hear about how vacant areas were uh, sort of resettled by the, the gay men moving into the areas on Polk Street and so forth. And then on the other hand, what you just mentioned, the uh, industrial areas that might have been dead and quiet at night became hot spots for other activity. That's kind mm -hmm. of a, a typical pattern. Um, but that redevelopment that happened in the 60s, that wasn't really because property values rose, because the neighborhoods were you know, sort of reclaimed and made nice again. That was just new development sponsored by the city or something that caused people to move. Right. Yeah. I'm thinking about the gigantic Moscone Conference Center development. I don't know if anybody knows about that in San Francisco, which is I'm not sure what planners think of it, but I think it's horrible. Um, yeah, that, so gentrification is another very, very complex theme related to this history that I think is actually being written right now. Um, gentrification has forced the relocation of, I would say, most of the lesbian community from San Francisco to places in the East Bay. Oakland, lots of lesbians left Mission Valencia and moved to Oakland um, in the 1980s and 90s because Mission Valencia was becoming unaffordable, especially for single women who are making less than men. Um, and that's happening now in the Castro. A lot of older gay men who've been living in subsidized housing or um, rent-controlled housing are losing their homes and can't afford to stay in the city. So what's happening as far as gentrification in San Francisco right now is really quite tragic. Um, I'm no longer living in San Francisco <laughs> because of gentrification. Lots of my friends do. Um, I was going to bring that up next, and there's a couple folks typing in with questions about um, the any links or relationships between affordable housing, low-income housing, and the LGBTQ community. Um, just like you said, you mentioned uh, that it's prices are skyrocketing and that it's, it's harder to afford. But I guess what about in in the past? Uh, how how has that has there been a relationship between uh, affordable housing and low income housing and the community? And uh, are there rumblings or what's going on to try to solve uh, the problem now with that with everyone doing 
not everyone, I guess, with sort of what appears to be a, a mass exodus just because of costs? I would say there are, I mean, I can't even think of any, any options for affordable housing. Um, it, it's almost like we're, people get caught, you know, especially like young urban professional LGBT people um, who are single, they're just sort of, they make too much money to qualify for affordable housing, but not enough money to be able to stay in San Francisco. So um, it's really is not my area of expertise, but that's the one thing that comes to mind for affordable housing, which is really not, it's sort of a um, tangent, but I think it's important to mention is there was a new, uh, the biggest question for a lot of people in the community right now is where are these LGBT seniors going to live who have lived in the city for 30, 40 years who can't live on their own or can't afford to stay in their apartments. Where do they go? Um, and there was a new development, I think it's in the Castro, but I'm not sure, for, it's a senior housing specifically for LGBT people and it was opened up to a lottery and the response uh, I think the letter has already happened in the response. Everybody anticipated it to be huge, and I'm sure it was huge, but it's so limited um, in terms of its reach. I think it's not that big of a place, but historically, I just want to mention, go back to the Tenderloin, and uh, while not you know, technically low-income housing the way we think of it today, I'm thinking of a place called the El Rosa Hotel, which was on Turk Street, um, El Rosa Hotel, like a lot of these residential single occupancy hotels in the Tenderloin, provided many of these people in these communities affordable housing, but the El, El Rosa specifically was the one of the only places in San Francisco that would provide housing for transgender women uh, who were living and working in the Tenderloin, who were most of whom were forced to work in the sex trade because they couldn't get work anywhere else. So. In terms of affordable housing, I look at a place like that, the El Rosa is just kind of crucial in the development of at least the transgender community. Okay. Um, with that, I think we're probably going to close up now because it's already 2.30. Um, so Shane and Cade, thank you for joining us today and for the Gallup Division Gays and Lesbians in Planning for sponsoring this session. Um, Cade, Shane, do you have any other closing remarks? Just thank you to Shane and, and to, to you guys for, for doing this. This was really great. Yeah, I think so too. Um, thanks everyone. Uh, again, just visit our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast for answers to lots of questions that you might have. We have our links up there uh, to register for upcoming webcasts and you can get information on this session for submitting your CM credits. So again, uh, thanks everyone for joining us and we will talk again next time. Thank you. Thank you.